Welcome to Grappling with Gray, a forum for promoting an ethical mindset and ethical decision making to help us more clearly see both sides of complex issues and better navigate the moral challenges of everyday life. I'm Rabbi Jonas Goldson, and I would like to welcome my guest today, Michael DeGroot, is a storyteller helping clients bring their business stories alive and is host of the Share Your Story podcast. Lisa K. McDonald is founder of Career Polish an executive career coach and master mindset coach who helps successful professionals reach their next phase of career happy and life healthy. And Tony McClelland is founder and director of First Life Group. She's a critical friend and business mentor in social justice, mobility, and impact. Thank you all for being with me. Especially Thank you. Tony Thank and you. Michael for traveling thousands of miles uh, to be here today. <laughs> So, here is today's ethics challenge. From the headlines, Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter has renewed debate over free speech versus responsible speech, over the need for, for and the dangers of censorship, over standards and double standards. Granted that implementing equitable policy solutions across social media may be beyond our reach, what about in the workplace? We want employees to feel free to express themselves, but we don't want to ignore caustic speech and behavior. We want to promote sensitivity and respect, but we don't want to compel speech. We want to create a culture where employees feel trusted, but we don't want some employees to abuse our trust in a way that makes other employees uncomfortable in the workplace. Increasingly, reports indicate that efforts to create a healthier work environment often backfire with some employees feeling vilified because of their identity and others feeling disempowered or tokenized by possibly well-intentioned efforts to support them. Given that some individuals are hypersensitive and others are socially clumsy or downright disrespectful, we struggle to set in place policies, checks, and balances to safeguard the dignity of employees while creating an and while without creating an, imp an, op an oppressive work atmosphere. Is it ethical to impose blanket policies that mo may go beyond their intended goals and produce unintended consequences? Is it ethical to do nothing if the cure might be worse than the ailment? How do we maintain our ethical balance while trying to improve workday cult workplace culture? I'm a little tongue-tied today, and uh, maybe because we've bitten off such a large uh, topic it's going to be a little hard to chew, but uh, there it is, and the floor is open. Wow. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> Who would like to go first? Well, Michael, you stepped up. Why don't you kick us off? Oh, thank you so much. I mean, my pleasure. It's, it's a massive topic, Jonas, and, and thank you for putting it up there for for us four to talk about, but I think the whole world wants to talk about it as well, don't they? And you've used some really, really important words in quite a lot of that. And I spent a long time in corporate life. I don't anymore, luckily, I think. And um, it's always been there, hasn't it? Everything you've mentioned has been around. I think it's great to mention Twitter as an opener to kind of get us to think about it because overnight they've had a massive culture change by just the change of ownership can you imagine that one day you were just happy in your job and then the next day you don't know if you're going to get a job anymore you know whether you're going to be fired or not that i, I really feel for people at twitter because they are all literally looking around saying who's next you know are we going to all lose our jobs um so i think for me what I feel kind of instinctively when I first read your brief was trust. Trust is, is so important in the workplace, you know, whether it's at the top or the workforce, the employees, the teams underneath. If we can have trust in an organization, I think it will go a long way towards solving some of the issues that you've raised. And I think that's you know self-evident that that uh, if a leadership conducts itself according to a, a code of ethics in a way that's recognized by 
the rest of the organization, then trust happens automatically. Yeah. And if mm -hmm. if employees don't see that, if if coworkers don't feel that, then there is a loss of trust. Once there's a loss of trust, there's naturally going to be a loss of commitment, uh, a loss of energy. We'd hear about quiet quitting these days. People just yes. don't want to invest themselves when there isn't yeah. uh, that sense of trust. So ladies. Yeah, I think I think that. Um... Thanks for that, Michael. And I'm just going to take a slightly uh, foundational approach and I'm going to come at it from the purpose perspective. You know, what is the purpose of the organization? What, you know, what is your mission, your vision, your values? What, you know, what, what is the organization about? And what is it that you're trying to do? You know, also just thinking about responsibility and accountability and are people acting responsibly and are they being held to account, you know? And I think that that plays a big part. So while we're grappling with the gray in the middle, I feel that it's about responsible, responsible open speech, responsible being, you know, the main, the main word there, the piece in the middle about how you manage that and the expectations around that. And the next piece coming out the other side is about the accountability. Are people being held accountable and are they being responsible so that's that's kind of really um where i'm gonna start that off i'm very Thank impressed you. honey with how you were able to weave in the title of this within your response by the way grappling with the gray that was i'm very impressed with that um, <laughs> what a great plug uh, in the middle and i i'm very much enjoying this conversation i think this is one that should be had everywhere, um, no matter the size of the corporation, no matter what it entails, because the bottom line is it gives us all an opportunity to learn. And mm -hmm. that's really the most important thing. You know, it all comes down to wisdom. Wisdom is, you know, always gained wisdom. Um, so I think that tying the two together, what Michael said about tr building trust mm -hmm. with your employees by being the example. And what Tony said, as far as the responsibility and the purpose, which is the intent behind, you know, the organization, I want to bring it then to the next step, which is, I feel like one of the most important parts that is missing is the learning aspect, because before we can implement anything, we have to know and learn and listen from each other to, to come together, to be able to put something in place. And I don't think there's ever going to be a blanket um, that will solve all problems. But coming together to learn to understand, I think, is the first step, which will then accomplish the other pieces that that Michael and Tony are speaking of. I think I think you're right on target with that, Lisa. The willingness to listen to people that we don't immediately agree with um, is something that we don't see a lot of. Uh, certainly not in politics, but it's it's entered society as well. And I'd sort of like to go back to a point you made, Tony, and you use the term accountability. Um, you know, the, there, there are a couple of terms that are widely used today. Uh, one of them is political correctness, and another of them is another one of them is woke. And I, and I think that both of these concepts emerged from a desire to create a more civil society and a more responsible society. And I think the objection to them is that what was intended to be a measure of accountability has become perceived as overreach and bullying and, and not consistently applied. So how do, we, how do we have a culture of accountability where everybody feels that they're being held equally accountable? Okay, can I, can I just respond? Is it okay to respond? Of course, of course. Because I think, um, I think that how I would kind of approach it is, is it's a 360, isn't it? Everybody's working together and it just kind of brings in what Lisa was saying as well. How are we working all of this together based on our purpose? And it's not just necessarily on the leader. Yes, it's, it's you know, they're accountable ultimately, but everybody's accountable. So I think that, you know, whether you're a leader or an employee or whatever position you are in the organization, you still have a title. Even if it's called employee, you know, you still have a title and with every single title comes a responsibility. And I think that if we lean into that, 
each and every one of us, regardless of what that title or responsibility is, then we're going in the in a better direction, aren't we? So even outside of the organization, whether it's a leader, whether it's a mother, father, husband, wife, you know, whatever the, that title is, role model, influencer, we all have responsibility and should be accountable. And so just coming at it from a 360 perspective, that's how I would kind of approach it rather than leaving it all on the leaders. Totally. I love that thought. I, yeah. I think that's a fantastic. And, and I would even add that that not only do you have a title, you have, you're a value contributor. That's right. So what are you contributing um, to the company, to the change that you want to see, to the environment that you want, the culture? So I would just piggyback on that, if I may, and say you have a title, you have a contribution. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like you can't complain if you're not, you know, you're, you're a part of this. So you need to take ownership of that piece of it. If, if I'm understanding what you're saying correctly. Yeah, no, ownership. I love that word. You know, there's also the other word that's come become popular is followership. And, you know, in, in, a, in, in warfare, you know, you'll have officers that um, men will follow into battle and in almost certain death. And you have officers that their men want to shoot them in the back when they, <laughs> they go uh, forward. You know, in order to be a good follower, you have to have confidence in your leader. And that's the responsibility yeah. of leadership. But it doesn't absolve the followers of being responsible for themselves, as you said, Tony. Michael, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I love the whole conversation around leadership because I have a question for Tony. Do you think everyone is a leader? Yes, I do. I do. But you have some people that are leaders with the actual title that goes with it. So yes. when I made that statement earlier on, you know, a few moments ago, that's what I was referring to. But I believe yeah. that everyone has leadership in them and everyone is a leader. Yes, I do. Yeah, because you you mentioned, you know, at home in your family, your mother, your father, your, you know, there are. People often in, in any area of life, they say, oh, no, I'm not a leader. But everyone is a leader in something, That's right. <laughs> you know, and therefore I, I like the way that if we can help people to see that they are actually a leader as well in their own lives, even then how can they bring that to the workplace, too? But then I also have this big question in my head two big questions but i'll just tackle one for now and that is there is always i've always seen a concept of let's call it us and them there is the leadership the management that's us and that's then we're them you know we're the workers and they have certain privileges that we don't have and we always feel separate and in conversation you hear teams or staff or employees, whatever term you want to call, they talk about them, you know. So I, I switched that around incorrectly. It's them and us, isn't it? It's not us and them, it's them and us. And so my question really for all of us is to say, well, free speech can only happen in a kind of proper way that is respected if you get rid of the us and them or them and us. <laughs> I like the way that you framed that, Michael, actually, that because it's made me start thinking about the fact that free speech, um, free speech is something that could potentially or mainly come from a place um, without the thought of accountability if you are in a position of privilege. Yes. And I think that's yeah, where it gets dangerous good. and it's been shown to do so. And that goes back to the accountability factor. So what is the litmus test that you put in place to hold that accountable? Mm. You know, there's a phrase that's uh, used often um, disparagingly, um, self-censorship. Oh, and, yes. You know, and, and I think that, I think it's obvious that we all do and should self-censor. Um, you know, I don't use profanity. Um, it's not consistent with who I am. Sometimes I may feel like it, um, but I don't think it's appropriate. Mm. Um, and certainly when I feel strongly, I have a strong opinion and I think somebody's saying something that really 
is not sound uh, logically, rationally, um, ideologically. But if I want to make my point in a way that's going to you know, be positive, going to be productive, then I have to choose my words carefully. Mm. And I have to articulate my message in a way that doesn't allow me to express all my emotions or all my feelings or sometimes even all my thoughts. It's just a matter of, of living as a member of a society or community. We have to be aware of each other. And I'm free to speak as I choose, but I choose to limit the way I speak in a way that's going to be conducive to a healthier environment. Mm. Well, you are free to speak as you choose, but as Tony has, has mentioned, there's there's a responsibility with that and there's accountability. And if you don't hold yourself accountable, then that's where I think those policies, that original question come into play. How also do we hold people accountable for not adhering to that's right. something that's a positive for the group? And kind of going back to something that I touched, if we're going to have such a policy, I think it's partnership should be the training because many people don't know how to self-censor. Um, you know, how many times have you wanted to tell somebody, you know, inside voice, or you actually said that out loud? I'm not sure if you meant to. Um, mm. So I think training as far as, you know, listening skills and emotional intelligence and decision making, that type of training along with a, a, an inclusive conversation about how to come up with the policy, I think would be a good one to punch to, to approach this topic. Mm, so, sorry. Thanks, Tony. I, I have a question for us all, and that is, what about our conditioned minds? Um, there is no amount of policy that will stop our conditioned mind reacting. We are so programmed by, let's say, ourselves, our partners, our teachers, our parents, society, the media, social media, the news, the cable channels, Jonasen, the every what we we're getting so many messages coming towards us and we will react in a heartbeat to something we'll tweet about something we may not put it on linkedin or anywhere else but on twitter we can say anything we like and it's our conditioned mind so when you take that in the workplace if people have been reacting in that way you could inevitably see a reaction could happen on an email reading between the lines, reacting to it, bang, it's done, it's too late. I've been to the, through the training, I've read the policies or I haven't read the policies, my monkey brain will just react. Do you know, I think, I think that you're absolutely right, Michael, but I also think as well that, is it all getting so complicated that you think, oh, if I move this way, I could be chastised and if I go that way, you know, we encourage freedom of speech, but actually as soon as people start opening their mouths, then they're chastised and uh, we've got all these people in the closet. So it's, it's kind of really, and I just think that it's the responsibility of each and every one of us. Each organization is very, very different as well. And they will manage things very differently. But I, for one, don't wanna be kind of rigidly fitting into all these policies, you know, this rigidness. You know, it almost feels as if you're being micromanaged by all these policies. Yes, let's have some light guidance. Let's use discretion. And if you've got experienced managers and leaders, they should be able to work within that space of, you know, use your discretion. Here's, but really, aside from the policy, I think the guidance is what's needed or a procedure that if, for example, that happens, these are the steps that you can take step by step the procedure but the policy oh my gosh I hear that word sometimes and just to kind of conclude by saying that I do I've done I've spent 30 odd years within central government working in public sector etc and yet the other side of me is in this space of compassion and uh, you know freedom and diversity equity inclusion and belonging and for me it's about how can I bring the two worlds together and it almost feels as if it's on an elastic band that sometimes it goes this way sometimes it goes that way but there needs to be a balance and um you know 
so I'm so we're still in the grey, but we're grappling with all the bits in the middle. But uh, <laughs> there does need to be that balance between formality and freedom. Yeah, I'm really happy to hear you say that. Uh, yeah, go, go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> I was gonna say, I think a great example of, of what Tony's speaking about is, you know, can we just go back to maybe a little bit of common sense and make it simple and, and stop trying to regulate so much was uh, GM. When Mary Barrett, and I hope I pronounced her name correctly, when she was CEO and she came in and she wanted to make a, an intentional change to the culture. And one thing she started with was the dress code. And it was like a 10 page document of the dress code. And she changed it to two words, dress appropriately. There you go. There you yeah. go. And it was, yeah. it, 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 and honestly, look her up on, on YouTube and she's done some interviews and she's just wonderful, but it, she gave the power to her, her leadership to say, okay, go problem solve. You know, go talk to, you guys can figure this out. It's not that hard. We have bigger yeah. things to do. And I think maybe, you know, the, it could be something as, as simple as be kind, you know, get back to, as Tony said, get back to the basics of human kindness. Yeah. yeah. I, lo I love that, uh, Lisa. I'm so glad you brought that up because I hadn't heard that story. But, you know, it goes back to your point earlier, Michael, your first point, I think, about trust, you know. Yeah. If 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 you if the policy says be appropriate, then the subtext is we trust you to be able to figure out what that means. Mm -hmm. Ten pages of detail about exactly how you can present yourself means I, we don't trust you. We don't trust you have common sense. We don't trust you to make good decisions. We have to um, codify every aspect of your life, and it goes back to that rigid. Uh, culture that you you were complaining about tony so did you uh, see my eyes light up when you said the word it was like ah! <laughs> <laughs> from yeah. here we did all the way across the pond we you did energy lisa yeah it was just kind of i frequently that... say that that compliance can be the enemy of ethics because mm. essentially what you're trying to do is you're trying to legislate ethical behavior and ethics is actually applying one's common sense to determines what what's right even if it may be legal it may not be proper or correct well so you could also look at it Jonathan, as are we setting out you know a policy that is so rigid that says when these things happen this is what we need to be doing etc or how this organization is behaving or is it about lisa michael this is how i want you to be a leader which we shouldn't really be, you know. This, this is where where I kind of see it. It's almost as if you're, it, as if that policy is setting out how you should be a leader, whereas yeah. you should come into that role. That you should already be bringing that to the party. So, you know, this is just a little bit of guidance for how we do things in our organisation. It's not a template for how you should be a leader. Well, I'd like to pose a question, if I may. Um, you know, Tony, you, you answered Michael's question that, that really we're all leaders, even if we don't have the title. Mm. So what is the definition of a leader? Doing the right thing. All the time. Yeah, being, a, being a model. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, being aware of yourself as well so that you can lead others, you know, lead yourself and others. That's that's really what what that's about, isn't it? But in an organisation, it's, you know, we talk about it as those people with the titles. But when I go into an organisation, I don't really, I, I might sit in the back of a, of a meeting and see who the real leader is. It might not be the one with the title. It might not be the one that's paid my invoice. But it might be that influential person over to the over to the right. Do you see what I mean? So for me, it's it's um, yeah, they they come in all different guises, and different things bring them out in bring different qualities out. So, um, but I think leadership is around self awareness. Are you able to lead yourself and others um, positively with authenticity yeah. too? Yeah. And I think you were talking about 
I'm, I'm just going back to a few things we said earlier about the trust hold trust thing. There was another thing that came up and it goes in terms of leadership. The leader could say to the team, you know, we trust you and do the right thing, you know, dress appropriately or whatever, you know, write your tweets kindly or whatever. Um, but we know you're going to mess it up at some point. Well, when you do mess up, we trust that you will do the right thing after that too. I.e., we know that you will realize that you may have messed it up and that you will correct it. And that we don't need to point it out to you. We don't need to babysit you. We don't need to parent you. You know, you're an adult. Um, and if you are worried that you might not be able to, we're here to help and train you. I think that's an excellent point. If, mm -hmm. if you feel that you're not able to, well, then that is, if I have an employee who is afraid of making a mistake, then I yeah. failed as a leader mm. because I haven't given them an environment to, to grow, to trust themselves, to do what they are there to do. And also everybody makes mistakes. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. Yeah. So yes, it's going to, but also when you make a mistake, I'm not going to punish you. I'm going to help you through it because that's part of my job as a leader. Love that. Yeah, I think, I think as well that there are some other things to consider about, especially if it's, it's external and public, you know, and that it, the mistake is, and, and the impact on that and, uh, you know, the consequence of, of that particular mistake and how you're going to deal with it. And I think sometimes in organisations, there's so much preventative work that goes in um I must admit I'm a preventative person so I much rather put the work in at the beginning rather than when it's all gone wrong you know but um there is that but it's about having that flexibility as well I can remember when I was younger and be you know being a leader in my organization everything had to go through the press office yeah everything mm. Mm -hmm. And those days we didn't have personal accounts. It was all business accounts and things like that. So, you know. I think one of the most powerful points that, that I've, I've taken away from this conversation is the importance of, of preparation in training in in defining the culture uh, of setting expectations. Um, because when people know what's expected of them and, and it's uh, the expectations are reasonable, rational, uh, then people are more inclined to rise to the occasion because they can recognize this is actually something I want to be part of. This is something that uh, that makes sense. And and when the, when there is a need for correction, you know, in in um, in Jewish law, there is an actual commandment in the Bible to give rebuke. Mm -hmm. And yet the the Hebrew word for rebuke shares its root with a word that means to validate mm. because when rebuke is given the right way which means the timing the place it's done privately the tone it's done respectfully the intent is to guide and and lead rather than uh than diminish uh, then what i'm really saying is i recognize your capacity to do better and I want to help you achieve what you're capable of achieving. And, and if, if, the, if the style is such and the culture is such, then there's no reason for a person to become defensive or, or concerned. If I make a mistake, I want someone to tell me yeah. because I don't want to keep making that mistake over and over again. I want to get it right. I think that's a great point about leadership is a lot of people think, oh, well, leadership, you know, you, you rally the troops, you lead them into battle and all these things. But the other side of it is doing those, those difficult things of having to, as it, using your, your word, well, not your word, they word rebuke um, to help grow because there's going to, you're going to have employees that came from a place that they weren't encouraged um, they, if they made a mistake, it was a punishment. Just think of all the Twitter employees. Now, if I screw up, is this the reason I'm going to, you know, what's do I even have a job tomorrow? 
Um, so sometimes, you know, the, the dirty side or the, the, the hard side of leadership is helping people understand it's okay. And this is, you know, we need to get through these weeds to get you to the place that you do trust us. I have to prove myself as a leader that you can trust me because they're coming from a place that, that they haven't experienced that before. Yeah. And I also think as well that this is about, it's okay to disagree. Yes. But we don't have to be arguing about it. I don't have to push my view on you. You don't have to push your view on me. I just need to be respectful of that. And, um, you know, it, you know, it was something that was said earlier on and it made me think about, um, you know, how often do we put ourselves in a place of discomfort to make other people feel comfortable? So, you know, that's the piece, isn't it? Really, it's about how can I feel comfortable and they feel reasonably comfortable. And I think it's about that social capital, isn't it? Building relations and investing in people. Absolutely. So many times that you have things that go to HR, disciplinary, all the rest of it, when it's re- it really could be just a conversation. Yeah. 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 We're, uh, this has been a really stimulating conversation, and I, and I thank you all. Um, we're pretty much at the end of our time. I'd like to offer you each an opportunity to, to sum up your final thoughts, take a minute or so, and uh, what's your biggest takeaway or your, your final, uh, final observation? Michael, will you start us off? Uh, I'll have a go. I, I really enjoyed that the conversation did center quite a bit around leadership. And I think we can all relate to that, whether it's Twitter changing their leader or whether it's a political leader in a country somewhere that's being changed. Um, we, we model on those people to a certain degree subconsciously as well. So I think to know that we're all a leader and that we, we can follow a leader, but we can also be our own leader in free speech too. That's me. Tony, you want to go next? <laughs> Thank you. Well, I, I just think that there was something in what was talked about in relation to privilege. And I think that something that I'm just going to put out there is around how do we, you know, ensure that those people who are sitting in a place of privilege are held accountable. And I think that I'm just going to kind of leave that one there. But I will just say that for me, You know, I'm a very principled person. I've got strong values. Um, I also have my own beliefs that come from a variety of places. I can change my beliefs, but I will not compromise on my values and my principles. So um, thank you for having me, Jonathan. It's been a pleasure. Lisa, the last word. I think that the last word that I want to leave with is, you know, the the guiding principle of that, that cannot go wrong is be kind and listen to learn. Wonderful. You, you, just, you just said something, Tony, that, that really resonated with me. Is, is you made a distinction between beliefs and values. And, and it goes to a point that, Michael, you made earlier that we absorb so many of our beliefs and our values from our environment, our parents, yeah. teachers. I mean, that's, <laughs> you took a line right out of my TED Talk that, um, you know, and, I, and I asked, uh, the audience and, and, and the viewers would say, where did you get your beliefs and where did your values come from? Did you mm-hmm. choose them or did they choose you? That's right. Because it's only when we're willing to go back and reevaluate and consider the possibility because you know, sometimes we are wrong. Sometimes we invest in things that are not good investments. And the willingness to listen, as you said, Lisa, to, to have that spirit of kindness and to be open to the possibility that maybe there's a legitimate way of looking at something that's not mine, but is still legitimate. And maybe, maybe at times I need to reevaluate my own principles to see if they really stand up to the light of day. And if we're willing to do that, then we can create healthier cultures and more collaborative, respectful, and civil uh, communities in business, in our homes, and, and in, in uh, and certainly in, in politics where they're desperately needed. Uh, so thank you all. This has been a really a, a delightful uh, conversation. And I do hope uh, I can get you to join me again. Um, Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. Thank you very much. All of you really enjoyed the conversation too.
And for those of you who are watching or listening, if you'd like to suggest an ethical scenario uh, or dilemma that we could take up for discussion, please go to my website, yonasandgoldson.com, and use the contact information there to submit it. If it's uh, compelling, we will definitely take it up. If you would like to become a Grappling with the Gray member, please go to gwtg.live. You can sign up for a free 30-day trial and enjoy member benefits. Um, and if you'd like to raise your ethical awareness, you can also go to yonasandgoldson.com slash freebie. You can request a free ebook, white paper, or infographic. Thank you again to my guests, and please join us next week for another ethical discussion as we grapple with the gray.